won't be any Madonna microphone, this one, because of issues. Uh, but yeah, uh, so I'm Lina, I am a policy project manager at the Free Software Foundation Europe, and we are a charity that empowers users to control technology, and we do so through Free Software. Um, so among different of our activities, we have the policy activities and that is the reason why I'm here today because uh, at the moment we're working on this Interoperable Europe Act, so I would be very happy to give you an overview on like the existing sort of framework on interoperability and yeah, what's new with this act and what kind of impacts can have on the a free software ecosystem. And if actually it would be the so called real game changer that it's supposed to be. So, alright, I have this thing as well. But not, not working. Now I don't know how to. It's not working. <laughs> Okay, got it, yeah. Okay, all good. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I always like to start my presentations talking about, you know, let's put everybody on the same page. Um, yeah, so whenever we talk about free software, and this is actually a very friendly reminder that I always like to do, and uh, that when we talk about free software, we're talking about for freedoms, the freedom to use, to study, to share, and improve the software. Um, and we all know, oh, yeah, that whenever one of these freedoms is uh, limited, then we're not talking about free software anymore. Um, so let's, um, yeah, I also already mentioned I'm going to talk about this act, but first I also want to kind of uh, put everybody on the same page when it comes to the term interoperability because you're going to hear this term a lot and you're going to hear me struggling with this word for 40 minutes or more. So, interoperability is the ability of information systems to talk to one another to, and be able to share uh, information and data across borders and sectors. And when we talk about this, then of course there is a need for a critical infrastructure and that's where free software plays a super important role because if the infrastructure is not made in the way that this information can be shared then it's impossible to talk about interoperability. So, before we go into the Interoperable Europe Act let's talk about what's here already and what's the state of play because there is already something that has been in place for the last decade and this is something that we've been also kind of using to support our demands over the last years. So this to say that this act doesn't come you know, all of a sudden but it's actually kind of built up on something that is already there. So um, I think whenever we talk about interoperability then we always talk about two declarations. Um, so now we're talking about member states uh, kind of giving a political commitment or doing a sort of like political communication. Um, and one of these uh, declarations is the Tallinn Declaration that was signed by member states in 2017. And then we already kind of see some wording on this direction. So um, yeah, the text said that it demands to make more use of open source solutions um, and also to strengthen the requirements of the use of open source solutions. So basically the member states that signed this uh, declaration are committed to, yeah, to do so. But again, this is just like a political communication, so yeah, not too uh, legally binding, so to say. Then after that we got the Berlin Declaration in 2020 uh, and it, you can see also like the wording goes in the same direction so when suitable open source technologies should be implemented in the development and deployment of cross-border digital solutions. So here already we start to see some kind of wording 
on you know acknowledging this the role of free software for interoperability. Um, we also have to say that I mean there is already something that it's there, but um, it's not perfect, of course, and it has a lot of like loopholes. And then if we really pay attention to the wording, then we can find it a little bit, you know, ambiguous or, uh, yeah, it could be improved. But uh, again, there is already something uh, on this direction. So now let's talk about the European Commission. Um, and then from the European Commission side, there have been some attempts on this direction as well. So I think it is important to talk about the, in the European Interoperability Framework. Uh, this is a European Commission communication and is supposed to be based on a voluntary basis from member states to take measures uh, on this kind of direction. So, for instance, then uh, we have also, I mean, the whole idea of this framework is kind of to offer guidance for member states to be able to deliver uh, interoperable digital public services. Um, and the last version of this one uh, is from 2017. And then again, we already see as well some references to open source as an enabler for the, uh, from the principles of this framework, especially when it comes to reusability. So in that regard, you know, like how uh, public administrations can interact with each other and can reuse existing solutions and adapt them to their own needs. Within this framework, uh, there is the framework observatory, like the National Interoperability, Interoperability Framework Observatory, which, is in which was in charge of um, kind of monitoring this implementation. Uh, but again, in kind of like a voluntary basis. Um, so they, they were kind of like identifying these good practices taking place on some member states and monitoring how the implementation was going. Uh, yeah, when we talk about interoperability, we also should uh, mention these programs, which were some European Commission funding programs, and they aim to support the development of digital solutions as well, uh, and to kind of strengthen the uh, interoperability across borders, but also across sectors. Um, and within this kind of funding program, then there were like some initiatives, so for instance the Sharing and Reuse um, Awards initiative which aimed to kind of raise awareness of the benefits of sharing and reusing um, interoperable solutions. Uh, and I mean this was kind of like a good example of how um, public administrations could network and could uh, you know, identify good practices taking place and yeah, reusing them as well. Um, ah, yeah, and by the way, I mean, these ISA and ISA Square projects that are not running anymore, uh, also because many lack of um, budget, uh, which again, I mean, shows, I mean, I think it shows that there is already things happening in this direction, but uh, you know, with the lack of a dedicated budget or lack of, I don't know, specific activities, then this kind of efforts cannot really run for too long. Um, the European Commission also has this portal, uh, probably some of you know it, uh, the Join Up portal, which is, um, yeah, it aims to serve as a point of entry for different best practices, for also sharing uh, here and there some free software solutions. Uh, I mean, and everybody can actually join and publish. And yeah, it's a uh, it's it's a nice way to kind of identify all these news and uh, best practices already taking place. Um, and well, now of course when we talk about. Uh, the European Commission's efforts, then we should also talk about the open source strategy. Uh, this is a strategy that came in 2020. Um, and then it is, again, a communication from the Commission to the Commission. So basically they were trying to 
set up some kind of guidelines on the way or like on the use of open source within the institutions, like within the EU institutions. Um, this document, unfortunately, uh, I mean, we acknowledge the, the first step on kind of bringing these guidelines and so on, but uh, it came with a lot of loopholes and like the wording is also quite uh, ambiguous because like for instance here it says that whenever it makes sense the commission will share the source code of its future IT projects but I mean when does it make sense and where it doesn't so it's not really clear um, and then there is also one part where the commission can choose to not use the software and it says where there are good reasons to do so. So again, I mean, it's not super clear when what good reasons are and where it makes sense. So it is not really a solid text um, and also lacks budget as well. And I feel that, uh, yeah, I mean, you will see through my talk that the lack of budget is one of the issues that uh, kind, of, kind of always come with this kind of documents. However, in one year later, so in 2021, the Commission uh, got a, like the release of decision, so this is now something binding, so now it's not a communication anymore, but uh, a decision. Um, and within this decision, they have implemented different uh, kind of features, so to say. So the first one is the public repository, so there is already a public repository for the EU institutions but also for member states to collaborate with each other and to share the free software solutions that they use. Um, and also part of this um, decision, they also introduced the OSPO, so the Open Source Office Program, program um, Officer, sorry. Um, yeah, but again, Within this decision, uh, there was also not super clear um, where the money was coming from or like where, you know, to kind of achieve these activities, uh, where the money should be coming from. Uh, but still, I mean, this is kind of like a step forward. We keep saying that things can get uh, better and things can be improved, but it's also I mean, it's also important to acknowledge that there's some kind of efforts happening. So, now that um, I kind of gave a little bit of an a overview of what was happening more in the European Commission and in, with some political communications with member states, I wanted to give a little bit of an overview on some specific member states that have some sort of like legal or policy guidelines or regulations uh, when it comes to public procurement and free software. So because of time, of course, I can only, um, I mean, I chose these three, mainly because, um, I mean, the first two are kind of some sort of progressive, so to say, and I mean, Sweden is also a in a way leading these efforts and I mean we're in Sweden so it would be also nice to give an overview of um, yeah, what's happening here. But first then let's take a look at um, then Italy. Uh, I mean in this kind of regard then Italy should can, or can be considered a progressive um, that has kind of like progressive uh, regulation on this regard because they have this decree um, that was actually updated this year where uh, yeah, whenever a public administration is going to procure uh, new digital solutions then uh, it should give precedence to free software um, and it should be pref a preference to the um, free software solutions that are already on the on a public uh, repository from Developers Italia and from other free software repositories. Um, I mean, again, uh, I think when we're talking about this kind of uh, yeah, regulations or legal policy uh, efforts, uh, it's, I think, the difference among, like, between the text 
and its implementation it's there's a big gap there and I mean we can see it also in Italy although they have this degree in practice it's not as perfect as, as you can read it here and again that shows us the the challenges that come with the implementation of the law but again um, this is kind of like we can consider that some sort of um, progressive legislation and yeah this is uh, the example of the of the public repository and they also have another ones but yeah so now um, now let's talk about France so in France there is also a law uh, that calls to on administrations to encourage the use of free software when developing or procuring um, new information systems um, and yeah as well I mean I think in France it's uh, very similar so again I mean although they have this this law uh, in practice also it's a little bit more challenging as uh, one might think uh, but it's I mean I, I, I think one of the points that I want to bring with this talk is to kind of highlight all these efforts not only happening I mean in the EU level but also in member states but also how you know kind of like those efforts are have been made you know like isolated so um, you know the question that I want to raise right now is like what if we just join efforts instead of you know doing our own thing um, yeah, and this is the public repository also from um, France. They also have other public, repos other public repositories where uh, public administrations share their um, yeah, free software solutions. And finally, um, we have Sweden, uh, which from what I know, it has more kind of like a soft and implicit uh, policy guidelines or yeah guidelines and there have been some attempts to go on this direction as well so for instance uh, this framework agreement where more than 200 administrations uh, kind of sign uh, when it comes to public procurement and free software uh, there is also something on open uh, IT standards and uh, this software development policy uh, that basically requires that all the yeah, software developing the Swedish uh, digital government DIG, uh, should be published as possible as I mean as open as possible um, and I mean I also know that there are a lot of efforts taking place in different municipalities and different a public administration, so I'm aware that the Swedish, um, what is it called? The Swedish Insurance Agency is also um, going on this direction. We have, uh, I, we have on uh, today and tomorrow on our legal policy tracks some kind of these examples of, you know, public administrations uh, trying to make use and promote uh, free software. But uh, again, they're like taking place in different places and kind of like, uh, yeah, in an isolated way. So I guess this is also one of the main reasons why now the European Commission last year, the end of last year, have, um, has uh, proposed the Interoperable Euro Pact. So it actually is aiming to, sorry, I need to work. So it's actually aiming to um, create this cross-border regulation to help member states to deliver interoperable digital solutions. So again, as we could see, there is already a lot of things happening, um, but some kind of like in a 
or, or, or like at least when it comes to the European Commission and member states, uh, communication that is more like in a voluntary uh, kind of base. And this is aimed to be, I mean, it's a regulation, so it will be legally binding. Um, and that is the reason why uh, we have decided to step in and to work on this file because we believe that this could have a lot of impact on the way that public administrations deliver public services and the role of free software in this whole, um, in these efforts actually. So now I want to, uh, yeah, let's take an overview of what's new, what is this whole thing about and what exactly they're trying to, you know, introduce. So first, uh, I also, I mean, there is also some other things that they're trying to introduce, such as trainings, uh, sandboxes, peer reviews. But I have to, I have decided to go through this because I consider that these are the kind of um, topics where uh, free software could play a role, but also that it could affect the free software ecosystem. So first, they want to introduce some kind of governance um, structure. So they are aiming to create two different bodies, so to say. So the first one is the Interoperable Europe Board, and the second one is the Interoperable Europe Community. So basically, the board will be the one kind of having uh, the decision-making power, so to say. So they're in charge of setting up the agenda every year, so setting up the guidelines. Uh, they're also in charge of promoting certain interoperable solutions and really a lot of more uh, kind of powers that this board will have. Um, at the moment, all the way the text it is, uh, is, is at the moment, so it will be constituted by the commission, uh, one representative of um, each member state, uh, one representative of the Committee of the Regions, and one representative from the uh, European e Economic and Social Bo uh, Board. Or, yeah. um, and these two are advisory bodies, so this is more or less how the board will look like. And of course the community then is broader, um, and the whole idea is there will be this bottom-up and top-down interaction. So the board will check with the community and the community will provide with expertise. Um, and in this kind of structure or governance structure, then uh, the agenda will uh, be set up. Um, the second one uh, is that they are trying to implement some kind of a mandatory interoperable assessments. So basically when a public administration want to uh, create a new um, inform or like, yeah, procure a new information system or actually highly modify one, then they should make an assessment of how interoperable this solution would be. So in this regard then here the public administration should, should think about if they can reuse or something that already exists or if they should procure something completely uh, new. Uh, they also want to uh, kind of change the way things are done. So they want to kind of make mandatory sharing and reusing uh, solutions. However, the way the text is written at the moment, it's also a little bit problematic because there is a part where it says that when requested, which, I mean, if it's an interval solution and if it's open and then it's, you know, available for everybody, then it should be, they, there should not be any need for requests and administrations should just by default be able to share and reuse instead of waiting to be requested or to request. And then, um, yeah, they also want to, I mean, they basically want to change the name for join up. So it would be this interoperable portal, kind of like what I show, 
it would be it would serve as a like a common point of entry for uh, administrations to share solutions, uh, but also uh, the monitoring reports will be shared here, as well as the the agenda that the board will uh, create. So basically, this is where everybody will find all this information and solutions um, because it will be this is the the single uh, entry. So this is more or less in a very broad uh, perspective what they're trying to introduce um, and I mean in the text already the play of the important uh, role that free software and open standards play here is acknowledged um, and we believe that it's a step forward however we also have found some loopholes uh, and yeah so now let's go through them the first one uh, it's yeah that more inclusion from different stakeholders would be better or would be a good idea especially in the body that has the decision making power which is the board um, and when i talk about stakeholders i'm especially talking about civil society and if i can be more specific then i'm also talking about the a free software community. So we believe that in such board, who is actually setting up the agenda and the priorities, um, the community, the free software community, should play an important role. I mean, it could also be the case that uh, the free software community is included as an observer, but it's still being able to see how the decisions are made instead of just be completely excluded from that could be also an option but in this point um, yeah this is not the case uh, and yeah we we will be part of the community but uh, we still believe that the free software community can offer much more than expertise so it should be you know at least an observer in the board uh, this kind of um, demand uh, it's has been already somehow uh, brought up in the European Parliament. Uh, so I think uh, some decision makers have already uh, identified that there is a need for more involvement of different stakeholders in the board. The second one is that at the moment there is no indicators or any way to measure progress whatsoever. So, I mean, we also believe that, I mean, in order to see how the state of play has changed over time, it is important to have indicators. And then if you're going to implement new activities or new measures, then you should, I mean, one should also be able to progress, to measure them and see how much of this progress has actually taken place. And this is not the case at the moment, so it's also not super clear the kind of activities that public administration should carry. So it is not clear the, like exactly the activities, but also how to measure such progress over time. So basically we want numbers and statistics that show us what has been done and what kind of progress has taken place. The third one is um, yeah, kind of expected. So there is a lack of budget, or dedicated budget. Um, so right now, public administrations in like uh, regional, local, all levels would have to carry on, carry on more activities or more, you know, just the assessment, so to say. And there is not a dedicated budget for this. So yeah, we believe that if this is not specified or at least clarified in the text, then it, this could fall, um, or it, it just could be another of the existing frameworks that are already in place. And I mean, although we know that this is not kind of like a funding program or anything like this, but at least you should be clear where the money will uh, be coming from. Um, there is also a lack of definitions, and we believe that. I mean, this is kind of the perfect place to define what we're talking about. 
So there is an article that includes some definitions and we also believe that open source and open standards should be defined in this file. So we should also, yeah, you know, in the future we could avoid this whole discussion again if we can just define here what we mean. And I think that will also give more clarity to a lot of uh, the new, like the, the, the measures that I want to introduce. Um, at the moment, there is some kind of monitoring that will be taken uh, care of by the European Commission. So the Commission will be checking the status of uh, the yeah, things or measures that have been taken. Uh, and we believe that there is a need for an independent body to actually do this monitoring. So we just came up with the idea that maybe the code of auditors could play an important role here because we always have to remember that when we talk about uh, digital public services, we're talking about public money. And then we have to make sure that you know, this public money is uh, spent in the most efficient way. Um, and also, again, as an independent um, auditor, it would be kind of uh, an idea, at least, to include the code of auditors, at least in the EU level, because, yeah, and then maybe like the national uh, auditors, member states could report to the code of auditors. But there is need for at least some kind of like independent monitoring and not just the European Commission monitoring what they do. Um, and here when we talk about, uh, again, digital services, then we have to, you know, talk about uh, procurement. Um, so we also believe that, I mean, it doesn't make any sense to talk about administration speaking with one another if public procurement keeps taking place the way it's been taking place in many places. So we believe that this is maybe a good uh, yeah, text or even just to bring up the discussion on a guideline for a cross-border uh, European procurement. So that at least there is some kind of uh, harmonized and common uh, procurement practices as a guideline as well. Uh, and I think this is not, I mean, at least the debate around this should be taking place because again, we, we cannot really talk about interoperability if we don't go back to uh, the procurement uh, issue as well. And uh, again, I mean, we're talking about code here, so all these free software solutions or interoperable solutions should be shared in a code share platform. So it should be people, should be or administrations should be able to find these um, solutions instead of requesting them. They should be available. Um, and this, I think all of this goes back to first that this act should have a free software first approach. So when we're talking about interoperable solutions that we should talk about free software. And uh, of course also all of uh, the loopholes or kind of demands that we have are also based on our public money, public code campaign, uh, which, yeah, uh, the public money, public code campaign is an uh, initiative that the FCP started more than five years, and it basically is requiring that uh, uh, digital solutions uh, that have been developed or procured for the public sector with public money then should be available to the public. Um, we have a work or like approach different uh, stakeholders and administrations and we're trying to uh, stress, sorry, stress the arguments behind this and showing the uh, public sector how they can share costs, that can also help to strengthen digital sovereignty, how with this they can also collaborate with each other 
And I mean, I think we already have some good practices taking place um, and we have an open letter for this as well, which has been signed by more than 200 organizations, uh, seven public administrations, one from Sweden, the Job Tech from the Swedish Employment Agency, um, uh, yeah, from Spain, from Germany, recently from Luxembourg. So I think this whole uh, kind of umbrella or like argument with the public money, public coach, it's also supporting our demands with the Interoperable Euro Bank because this is exactly what we're talking about. So if you're going to procure something new, then let's try to make sure that it is a free software and it's available to the public. Um, so uh, now I would like to talk a little bit what's next with the, with the file, with the act. So at the moment, so the European Commission already presented this proposal, and now this has, uh, or is discussed by the European Parliament, by the Council. Um, and yeah, once they have their own uh, version, then they will uh, have the um, interinstitutional uh, discussions or uh, the trials. Uh, from the council side, then I mean, the Sweden is holding the presidency at the moment, so it will pretty much kick off the negotiations, and then they will see three of them to decide on the final text. So there is a lot in front. I mean, we really don't know how much of this can take, but the whole point is that this is still a draft that. Probably some things that I talked today can be removed, can be highly modified, or can stay the way they are. Um, and we are trying to uh, push our demands for now in the, I mean, through the European Parliament. So we're doing, uh, we're trying or aiming to uh, talk with some decision makers and also change our demands, but also our arguments. And we're also trying to help them because um, this is also a case that most of the times that don't really they're not really experts on the topic. Uh, so we're trying to guide them, and by this also trying to influence in, influence the way the text will look uh, in the end, if possible. Um, and yeah, I mean just to kind of wrap up. Um, you can, you all can help us. So if you're interested in this, if you have some input, uh, we'll be more than happy to hear and to exchange some insights. You can also convince your local administration. So I, I think we always like to give this kind of friendly reminder that you know administrations are not only like the parliament or the mayors or you know the congress, but the universities. The libraries, they are also public administrations and they are also making use of public money to um, digitalize their infrastructure. So you can always reach out to your local administration, you can briefly or <coughs> yeah, stress the benefits of free software. Um, and then also you can I can ask them to sign a open letter, but we also believe if they're of if they become more aware of the benefits that free software can have uh, in the digital public infrastructure, then this is still something, this is still a win. Um, you can also sign an open letter. Uh, you can go to the publiccode.eu website, you will find the open letter there. And you can sign as an individual, as an organization, or even a, as a public administration. Um, so you're all more than welcome to do so. Um, you can also donate to us, so we are a charity. Uh, so we uh, are based on the support of our communities, or the community. Um, and I, I, I really believe that this gives us the freedom to push our demands. So that was make us independent. Um, so your support is, is really, I mean, it really enables us our work. And of course, uh, you can spread the word, so we have a lot of uh, material for this. We have a booth 
there where you can you know take all the um, promo material that we have you can share this with your communities with public administrations uh, and you can talk about the benefits of resolve work with PMPC or you can also start to bring up this discussion on interoperability and the benefits of free software on this. Um, so yeah, make sure to take a few uh, leaflets or brochures. We have a very nice brochure on public money, public code, where we highlight some good practices. Uh, that also there is something on procurement there, so I really invite you to take a look at it and to take a look at the website. Uh, there is tons of information there. And that's also the place where we share our positions and our news and yeah, good practices. We also highlight some good practices taking, uh, taking place all around Europe. And yeah, with this I think I have some time for questions and I hope this uh, gave some kind of like overview of what's happening and what kind of challenge, challenges we have in front for this act to be a real game changer. Thank you. So, raise your hand. Otherwise, I will ask a question. So, so how do you see the public procurement routines sort of stopping the use of open source software? Because we usually don't have a products offering per se, and that's often what's being procured. Uh, which I think is a blocker. Uh, like the, the public procurement rules mm -hmm. that you try to look for a product offer. And that's not how open source work. You always adapt. So, so you need some sort of middleman taking upon themselves to adapt open source to actually fulfill the requirements rather than buying the services and just using the 90% solution. So you pay very expensively to develop 100% instead of 10% because of the way that it's worded. And procured. I'm not sure if that's a universal problem within Europe or if it's a Swedish yeah. problem yeah. or even smaller. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't know, I mean, but this is something that it happens, uh, yeah, I wouldn't say not only in Sweden. Um, and this is exactly what we meant when we want to bring the discussion about public procurement. I mean, we also know that public procurement is a national affair, so there is nothing, uh, I mean, there is nothing really like binding that uh, it could be made in the EU level, but we're talking about guidelines or like public administrations to be able to create this kind of network that make, you know, the, the, the requirements for pro public procurement of free software easier, you know, so if you know how the, your neighbor public administration is procuring, um, and you know the, the solution, then you should be also able to, you know, have this information and kind of like some sort of having a harmonized way to handle this public procurement because it is true right now. It's, this is an issue uh, and for a lot, like a lot of times then it's really difficult to, to procure a free software solution because the, 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 all the tenders that are competing is, are like, you know, super difficult or like super uh, you know, giant, so uh, to kind of build this uh, harmonized way, or at least again, just bringing up the discussion of how this is handling, uh, I think this is the perfect uh, act to do so. If we're going to regulate the way public administrations are uh, handling or de delivering public digital services, then let's also talk about how we're handling public procurement. And let's, you know, try to learn also in a harmonized way. So we hope that with this, or oh, like bringing up this, uh, like raising, uh, raising these issues or concerns can bring uh, a little bit of more awareness in the in member states on how public procurement takes place. And we have one more question. We can have many more, but I found one. So if this passes, what do you think is the chances that there will be interoperable products and standards all over Europe, but they don't interoperate. You have hundreds of interoperable projects, but they don't collaborate together. I mean, I think, I would say if we somehow manage to make this sharing and reuse actually the default, then I, I, 
I, I like to be positive and I would like to see or say that public administrations want to first know what's out there and how somehow they can share costs instead of procuring something from zero. So I would say if this kind of ecosystem is built up and it's open and this network of solutions, so to say, it's open and available for every single administration, then I want to believe that they will go first in this direction of, you know, checking first what's there. Because I, I sometimes I feel that a lot of public administrations don't know of, you know, the solutions that others are using. And I've been noticing this when I'm having calls with different uh, with public administrations. And when you highlight a good practice taking place, they're like highly surprised and they're like interested as well. So I feel like a lot of times um, these solutions are not well, you know, visible, or their public administrations are not aware of uh, this kind of solutions already being developed and used by others. Uh, maybe I misunderstood one of the points regarding uh, what's happening in Sweden in terms of uh, digital solutions done for public organizations. Uh, did, I, did I get it right that uh, any project that you do for a, a public organization in Sweden need to be made open source? Not really. I mean, uh, also from what I know, the, the legal policy frameworks that are in place in Sweden are kind of like implicit, so they're not, I mean, there is not like a whole framework or like whole regulation setting up these conditions. So there are different things happening here and there. And the last one that um, I talked about, maybe I can go back, um, is, uh, yeah. It's mainly about the digital solutions developed by the Swedish uh, Digital Government Agency, uh, DIG. I don't know how you pronounce this in Sweden, in Swedish, but yeah, so basically if they're uh, developing or procuring something, you know, then it should be, it should be uh, open source, but not for the whole, um, for whole Sweden. So this is the, the, the thing that there's here and there are small things, but it's super subtle and super, yeah, implicit, so to, so to say. Maybe a uh, follow-up question on that then. So, uh, what are the points do you think is kind of restricting uh, the international community or European community to kind of enforce uh, uh, making any open or, or any projects which is going into a, a public organization open source? What are the uh, main points which is kind of stopping it uh, uh, to kind of implement this particular thing? For uh, yeah, in the private sector, in terms of if anybody wants to contribute to a public organization, so what are the points which is kind of stopping uh, government to impose it to make it open source? So did I understand right that uh, I mean, in what way this act will change kind of the status, like the status quo or like the state of play, and make uh, the free and open source solutions uh, required, so to say? Is that the question? I don't know if I if I got it right. Let me try to rephrase it. Uh, yeah, I'm also not expressing it, right, but uh, so uh, is there some key points which is kind of restricting this uh, European acts to impose public organizations from uh, not accepting any software which is not meant to be open sourced? I mean. Right now, I mean, there is nothing on that. I mean, there is also no like, if you're gonna procure something new, then it should be free software. Um, and that is the reason why we're trying to step in to kind of bring up this demand. Um, we, I mean, we also don't, we're not completely sure if we're just gonna, you know, for all these interoperable solutions, if there should be all free and open source. You know, like, I think by default, interoperable solutions are free software. Otherwise, I mean, there is no way one administration can uh, communicate with one another if it's not, you know, at least open uh, for them. Let's, let's call it like that. So what we want to do is kind of like 
Whenever we're talking about interoperable solutions, then we're talking about free software, and that's why this act should go on the free software files uh, direction. So to actually bring uh, or highlight the importance that free software play to make digital solutions interoperable. And if somehow we manage to achieve this, then you know, then later by default, then interoperable solutions would mean free software uh, solutions. But at the moment, there is nothing on on the text on this direction, and that's actually one of the proposals that we see. I have one last question from here. Hi. Um, to what extent this um, national policy, like the software development policy for Sweden, for example, to what extent does it actually apply to European institutions conformed by different countries? One example, the European Space Agency, which Sweden, I think, is part of it, right? So, Sweden has a software development policy to prefer free software and, right? Um, but, in fact, for example, the, in the European Space Agency, they use uh, a license that does not qualify as a free software license, nor open source software license. So, to what extent those policies, which I guess are per country, right, apply to the European institutions participated by those countries? Okay, I mean, I think this is the problem that we have at the moment, that until now, then we have this kind of political communication or commitment signed by member states where they say that whenever they can, they will use the software to enhance interoperability. Or this, we have this uh, Europe interoperable framework, which is also like based on a voluntary uh, basis for member states to take measures. And this has been what, I mean, this is what has been happening. So we have Italy doing this, France doing there, Sweden doing something else. You know, Germany doing something else, but the goal of this new propose, uh, proposal is that somehow they want to harmonize these efforts. And this would be a, uh, a regulation, so it would be binding. So now member states have to actually take measures and implement uh, or going or taking efforts to go on this direction. Because, I mean, at the national level, influence in the EU level, I mean, I don't think that's, you know, that's a way, so this is exactly what is happening. So, a member states taking different measures uh, independently, but with this act, it will be some kind of like harmonized and it will be a guideline for member states to do it more, you know, in a, in a more common way. But do you really, do you think that this is going to bind institutions like the European Space Agency, which is paid by the, by the European citizens, and also public companies like Airbus, for example? Um, we, we don't have, um, I mean, this is for member states, uh, like the European uh, the open source strategy and this decision on, uh, like from the Commission, this is kind of uh, guiding the EU institutions. So, again, I want to try to keep positive and believe that, at least in member states, that this should be, this will be kind of like a start point for them to, you know, go in the same direction. Um, and I mean, that's why we're also trying to implement ways to monitor this progress and to actually see that all these nice ideas and activities are actually having some effects or are actually doing something. And at the moment, this is not the case. I mean, at the moment, we don't have the way to monitor this. So that's why we kind of like our demands kind of complement each other because there is no way to measure that without indicators. Thank you. And thank you for working on this. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for, for your talk. Thank you.